uh, Jerry called me uh, Saturday and uh, asking if we would take, and people would probably want to take a, a special offering for uh, the refugees in Ukraine. And we thought it best that we first give an announcement so it's be a week ahead so people can, can prepare for that. So we're planning on next week take a special uh, offering separate from their, you know, our, our normal tithe and offering and it will be designated to go to one of the ministries that's supporting the refugees uh, in Ukraine. So uh, be thinking about that, praying about that too this week, and we'll, we'll be doing that next, next Sunday here. So, um, Also something else that happened uh, Wednesday night in our meeting, Jerry mentioned that, uh, you know, that the Lord is coming back for a, a pure, spotless bride. And if you think about that, how does that happen? And I think the only way it happens is pressure. Pressure comes and it causes us to get rid of all of our false comforts, crutches, false comforts, or crutches that we have that we lean on that, that aren't the Lord. And I... Uh, and I just think that pressure is going to be increase, increasing a lot in our lives. Um, this morning as I was praying, I just felt like, you know, we look at what's going on in, in Ukraine and what's happening with Russia, and I think we all have a normal bias, and I do too. And so what I'm thinking is, if this continues to go on, and, and let's say Russia finishes taking Ukraine, well, then after a few months, things will settle down, things will get kind of back to normal, and our lives will get back to normal. But that's our normal bias. I think, well, one thing I know, there is a coming third world war. I don't know if this is the beginning of it. I don't know if it's 10, 15, 20 years down the road. But there is another world war coming. And if this is the beginning of it, then we need to be prepared, thinking spiritually first of all, of what is coming and how our lives can be changed overnight and how important the Lord is in the midst of that. So I just kind of want to encourage you guys, just begin to pray, begin to ask the Lord, begin to ask the Lord to show you things. You know, it says the Holy Spirit will lead us into all truth. It will show us things that are to come. So we need to be a people prepared, not shaken. And I, I certainly don't want to uh, cause any fear or anxiety. I think it's just reality that we have to realize that we are living in, in unique times. You know, we've had this pa pandemic that affected the whole world and ne not necessarily even over. But if you look at what happened in World War I and World War II, there's a lot of the same setup going on within the nations, especially during Eastern Europe. And, of course, in World War II, it was, it was Germany in the West, and then it was Japan in Asia. And now the players have changed. It's China in Asia, and, of course, Russia now in Europe. So we need to be really on our toes, be listening, be tuning in to what the Spirit is saying, and not be shaken, be, be looking for, for those things that could possibly be happening. And like I say, I don't know if this is it, but I do know there is a coming third world war that will be coming. I remember Bob Jones prophesying that many years ago. In fact, he said at that time, we were all probably in the 20s and 30s that, that we would be older at that time, and I qualify as older now. So uh, I think we're, uh, we're getting to close to that, that time being, being fulfilled. And, but, you know, it's not necessarily all negative because it's in that context, context of pressure, context of, of things being shaken, that people are open to hear the Word of God. And again, people who maybe never would give you a time of day will all of a sudden be asking questions 
and wanting to know what's going on, what's the future hold. But it will interrupt our lives and it will interrupt our plans that we have. But that pressure will also cause us to get rid of a lot of things, a lot of encumbrances, like Hebrews says, encumbrances that we need to shake off and be totally focused on the Lord, of seeking first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, knowing that all these things will be added unto us. So even in the midst of all this shaking, we need to stand strong and just have that faith that God's, God knows where you are. He knows your name. He'll take care of you. Just be at peace and be listening to what the Holy Spirit says. All right, this morning, I uh, titled this, I think we have a title. Yeah, it's time to do. Uh, first, I want to kind of go over you know, two weeks ago, I kind of went through what our, because I think it's, it's critical, important for us to, to know what our core values are again. So I just want to kind of go over that again real quickly. And, I, you know, like our mission statement, which says, knowing God and making him known. And again, that knowing God is just us growing in intimacy with the Lord, uh, is growing in understanding of him through the word of God. It's growing in prayer and just becoming, because we can't export what we don't possess. So we have to have it ourselves before you can give it away. And obviously the making him known part is evangelism, it's ministering to others, it's uh, providing, you know, like in this case for refugees somewhere else, it might not be a direct contact, but it's, it's blessing other people. And reaching out, whether that's uh, friendship, evangelism, but it's spreading the word of God. Now, there are, I, I listed four different core values, and I'm, I mentioned that we started this uh, three years ago. Well, we've completed three full years now, so we're going into our fourth year uh, of, of a new model of what we think is uh, genuine new Christian, you know, going back to early Christian model from the book of Acts, uh, model of church and how it's to function. But those core values to accomplish that were, were servant leadership. And we talked about how Jesus was our example where he said he did not come to, to be served, but to serve and to lay down his life for others. And then we have the example of Paul who was a he was a tent maker, so he supported himself and some of the other missionaries with him uh, through his craft, through his job situation or his business. And so every leader that we have uh, is a volunteer. We all volunteer. No one gets paid, so there, there are no hirelings, and that's not to put anything on another church or anybody else. That's just, just what we have kind of set up to to exemplify, and we think that helps us to emphasize also the priesthood of the believer, so it's not, and and kind of does away with some of that difference between laity and supposedly the priesthood or the professionals. Uh, We are all called, we all have gifts, we all have callings. And it also is opposite the spirit of control and manipulation. So, first one was servant leadership. Second one was the fivefold ministry. So, you have the apostle, you have the prophet, you have the evangelist, you have the teacher, and you have the pastor. And most churches today, you have a pastor that are trying to fulfill all five of those roles, which is basically impossible for anyone to do. And so, you need to hear from all those different gifts. And it's a team ministry, so we will even have different teachers up here. Uh, Nathan will be up here a lot of times, and so you get different views, you get different emphasis, you get different uh, backgrounds, but, it, but that all helps to form uh, a better picture of the Word of God. And number three was empowering the body to use their gifts to build up the kingdom. And we went through the scriptures in Romans 12 and also 1 Corinthians 12, which has a long list of different gifts. And so each one has been given a gift. Each of you 
have been given gifts, and we need to make sure that we're activating them and actually using those gifts. Um, and so we're building uh, a church that is both a family and is an army. So it's both going out, it's a family relationships, but it's also aggressively going out. And number four was praying for and preparing for revival. And that's our heart cry is to, is to cry out for that, for a move of the Spirit, a mighty move of the Spirit that will touch the lives in our community and beyond. And one of our prayers is for not just for our house, for revival, but for churches all across this nation and for a third great awakening to come to this nation that would turn this nation back to the Lord, to the godly, his godly ways. So that's kind of the core values. And now I want to go on to what we're talking about today. And on the fivefold ministry, I do want to mention a couple of things. One thing, we have to be uh, careful with titles. Sometimes we, we talk about apostles. A lot, of, a lot of groups have a lot of apostles, you know. But when I look at what the Scripture says, uh, in 1 Corinthians uh, 9, verse 1, Paul says, Have I not seen the Lord? Now, when he said that, he wasn't saying that he, he saw the Lord when he was alive, when Jesus was walking his three and a half years. No, he's talking about that Jesus appeared to him. And actually, if you go to Galatians and taught him personally, he said, I didn't receive the gospel from man. I received it from Jesus. So it was Jesus teaching Jesus. Can't get any better than that. Another thing, in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, he says, the things that mark an apostle, signs and wonders and miracles. And again, some groups just kind of view an apostleship as someone who's kind of a CEO, and maybe they have several other churches with them, and they kind of oversee that. But I go back to those scriptures that say, and to mark the apostles, signs, wonders, and miracles that maybe we have a little lower requirement than what the Bible does. The other thing is, is with a prophet. Everybody can prophesy. In fact, it says in, you know, in 1 Corinthians, it says, desire the greater gifts, and especially that you might prophesy. But not everybody who prophesies is a prophet, because that's like a higher level. That's, that's a, a level that's recognized at the level that uh, is not just talking to individuals, but talking many times to world events or nation, nation events. So, so anyway, just to be careful about that we don't just throw tiles around, start making business cards with our apostle name on it. So, you know, yeah. All right. So, Acts 1-1 is what I'm going to start today. Real short verse. And we're going to go, and actually I first heard this many years ago when Paul came. I know some of you may have heard his name. He was a prophet. But I'm just going to read that verse. It's in, the former, in my former book, Theopolis, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven. So everything he began to do and to teach. We do a lot of teaching, and teaching will never go out of style, and we need to continue to put an emphasis on teaching the Word of God. But where we are weak on is the doing part. Doing, manifesting. I think of John 14, 12, where Lord Jesus says, the works that I shall do, you shall do, and even greater works, because I go to the Father. We have yet to see that fulfilled. But there is a generation that will see that fulfilled. And I think it's going to be the same generation that is enduring probably persecution and some very hard times in the natural. Uh, but it will be fulfilled. So teaching is important, and we will continue to teach, but we need to begin to put an emphasis. And when I'm talking about an emphasis on doing the things, or John Wimber say doing the stuff, 
you know, it, it's not people necessarily who are standing up here. It's you people out there. Okay? So Romans chapter 15. I'm just going to go through a, a few scriptures here. We kind of make the same, the same point. Verses 17 through 19. Again, this is uh, Paul speaking. And he says, Therefore I glory in Christ Jesus in my service to God. I will not venture to speak of anything except what God has accomplished through me in leading the Gentiles to obey God by what I have said and done by the power of signs and miracles and through the power of of the Spirit. So he says, I have accomplished by leading the Gentiles to obey God by the power of signs and miracles and through the power of the Holy Spirit. And it's important that we focus on that part. It's by the power of the Holy Spirit. But each of us are capable of and have the same spirit living within us that Paul did. But it begins to take, where well, we have to begin to take a step forward in seeing that spirit, the same spirit, Holy Spirit within you, begin to be manifested in those same things, in signs and wonders and miracles. Now, in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, I'm going to read 1 through 5. So he's speaking to the uh, Corinthian church, and he says, when I, come, when I came to you, brothers, I did not come with the eloquence of superior wisdom as I proclaimed to you the testimony about God. For I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. I came to you in weakness and fear and with much trembling. My message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with demonstrations of the Spirit's power, so that your faith might not rest on man's wisdom, but on God's power. So Paul said it was not with persuasive speech, it was a simple message. I preach Christ and Him crucified. But it also came with the demonstration of the Spirit's power, so that your faith may not rest on men's wisdom, but on God's power, which is why the gospel went out so quickly across the world and spread so quickly because of, of signs and wonders and the Spirit being anointed. And in chapter 4, Verse 20, a short verse, Paul says, For the kingdom of God is not a matter of talk, but of power. So the kingdom of God is not a matter of talk, but of power. First Thessalonians chapter 4. All your T's are back together there. First Thessalonians chapter 4. And verse 19. Well, I'm not finding where I am here. There we be. I'll read you the verse, and then I'll try to find it here. But anyway, it says, Do not put out the Spirit's fire. Okay. Do not treat prophecies with contempt. Test everything and hold on to the good. But the first part of that, do not put out the Spirit's fire. Well, he wouldn't say that unless it was very easy for us to put out the Spirit's fire. 
And so we have to be on guard, stirring up ourselves, stirring up the Holy Spirit within us. It's kind of like when David was at Ziglag and, and his family had been taken and uh, his own men were ready to stone him. And he said he stirred himself up in his spirit. So sometimes we have to stir ourselves up in the Holy Spirit. So do not put out the Spirit's fire. Okay, another one's First Timothy, just right next door. First Timothy, chapter four, and verse fourteen. And he's talking to Timothy, and he says, "Do not neglect the gift which was given you." Through a prophetic message, when the body of elders laid their hands on you. So do not neglect the gift that has been given you. Again, if it wasn't possible for us for, to neglect the gifts that we've been given, he wouldn't be saying, do not neglect the gift that has been given you. Again, everyone in this room has been given a gift or gifts. We all need to stir them up. We can't neglect them. The last scripture, 2 Timothy, chapter 1 and verse 6, he says, For this reason I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God did not give you a spirit of timidity, but a spirit of power and of love and self-discipline. But I remind you to fan into flame. So for some of you, I know people probably in here who have taken prophetic training before, classes, they've probably taken uh, healing classes, they probably have taken uh, deliverance classes, and yet probably within there that the only thing that's left is a small ember. And I think that's when he's telling Timothy, fan into flame. Begin to fan that little thing that you, that little spark that you see, begin to fan it into flame so it becomes a roaring fire. And again, I want to emphasize that all of us have been given gifts. And so... What we're going to do is we're going to activate and practice because, again, it takes the whole body doing their part, each one using their gifts to build up the body, to, to cause the kingdom of God to grow and to flourish. So for each of us, I think we all need to begin to fan that flame of those gifts that's been given you. And if you don't know for sure what your gift is, today would be a good time to find out. So we're going to, in a minute, we're probably going to go ahead and and do a song in a minute, but then we're going to have more of an activation where all of us, not just us up here front, but we're going to put the pressure back on you guys. Okay? Okay. Lord, that you'd begin to awaken that fire, that you'd breathe upon that ember and cause it to come into a flaming fire. We say, welcome you. We welcome you, Holy Spirit. We say, come, Holy Spirit. Come in power. Come in might. Anoint your people, Lord. Equip them. Stir them up even now, Lord. Stir them up, Lord. We need you. We need your fire, Lord. We call for the fire of God to fall upon us. A fresh day, Lord, of Pentecost, of the outpouring of your spirit. Lord, stir our hearts up, Lord. Do a work, Lord, as only you can do. Do it, Lord. Come, we're hungry, we're thirsty, we're crying out for more. Lord, meet us here, Lord. Meet us with the more, Lord. Come, Lord. Come, touch us. Refresh us, Lord. Refresh us, Lord.